Hi, my name is Winslet, and welcome to my video diving into screenshots I took from the first gameplay stream covering Eldritch Realms, which is the fourth expansion for Age of Wonders 4. Just like I've done with the previous gameplay streams by the devs, I went through and took screenshots of all the interesting numbers and mechanics that popped up for a few seconds so that we could take a closer look at them together. For example, I think they hovered over this story realm for less than half of a second, and this little description popped up um, very briefly so we'll be taking a, a closer look at things like that i will have timestamps below so if you want to jump to any particular topic or concept you can do so i will, I will also be posting these images to the official age of wonders 4 form so that if you want to look at them together with me you can use that link in the description below important disclaimer a lot of the numbers we will be looking at today are from a relatively early version of age of wonders 4 and the devs have recently announced that they will continue to support the game after this DLC, after this expansion. So these numbers are likely going to change quite significantly when they do get around to that. Now, before we really dive into the screenshots from this video, what I wanted to do first was to go over the fact that I have 45 pages worth of images here, and I took a few images from Discord where they were talking about some things covered in the in the stream like the way leveling works now and i'd love to talk about that at the end of the video as well as how we got a couple leaks on the age of wonders 4 official discord of, of voxel one of the developers and jordy one of the developers were posting things like this bingo card um, and then more recently we got to see things like the blueprints if we look on the left we can see that there's three blueprints that this player could choose between when you look at the radiant orb of shattering it looks like it's going to cost some imperial essence it's going to take some time to complete it's going to use some infusion points that's pretty typical what's really unique about this is the fact that it's going to take two rainbow clovers and three fire forge stones in order to get the effects that this item would get it it's going to need the rainbow clover to get the radiant damage and then the fireforge stone to get area damage which i assume would work kind of like the storm crow's primary attack where it does kind of like a blast on a repeating attack um, so it's not a lot of damage across the guys that are around it but it can add up over time it could be that this is a full action we don't really know just looking at this um, but my estimation is that this is going to cost more magic materials or better effects that don't take up a lot of infusion points. I think you're going to get more out of your infusion points if you use things like these blueprints, but that's just a guess based off what we can see here. Um, but yeah, moving on from there, they did mention in one of the other posts something about a spirit summon, a shadow spirit summon, which should be similar to this Age of Wonders 3 unit, the shadow stalker i think is what it was called it, i'm i'm excited to see that i hope that that uh, is something that they get to show off in one of the future streams i would imagine that since it's a shadow thing that it would appear in the shadow affinity tree maybe like a tier one tome i don't know if it would make sense to put any of the um lesser spirits in a uh in something other than a tier one tone but maybe this spirit is like a tier three spirit that we haven't quite gotten to see yet i know that there's supposed to be something about more piglets, maybe like the ones from um, Planet Fall. Uh, there's more in here, like the potential thing, which I actually covered in the stream. Um, I think Dissonance was covered. And what else is in here? There's, there's a lot that they kind of threw together very quickly. Um, yeah, they talked a little bit about the things that are going to appear. So yeah, I think at this point we can take a quick look at this screenshot the bingo card before moving on to this description of Urath, who i think is very likely going to make an appearance in this dlc so the sovereigns were covered astral yeah ha happening i don't uh, yeah cosmic happenings was event system yes yeah, that's happening bugs is happening potential is happening it looks like all these are true and dalian we don't have confirmed yet but i'm very i i think that's gonna be a very big part of the story realms seeing as they've released in a um and dalian and grexilis or something like that Crises, yeah, cosmic happenings, I think, are like those crises. They did mention about something about like seasons and tolls in the, the dev diary. Um, yeah, the abyss, corruption, those are things that we've all seen. Archelot, I don't know what that means. Thralls, that's a thing. Yeah, like pretty much all of this that they mentioned appeared in the in the actual stream, which except for like blueprints specifically. Um Ureth is 
I think, an evil Endalian. No, Endalians are a group of cosmic beings that waged wars against the Archons and the Karazor. Um, great enemy of Archons. He's an eldritch being believed to be the source of evil in the cosmos. Yeah. I, I think that seems like he might want to appear here. All right, so for our first screenshot here, we have escaped to the prison on the edge of the astral void through Kath. And I think I, I heard them talking about how this new umbral realm is not the shadow realm. It's like the shadow realm. At one point, they did call it the shadow realm, but it's outside of the astral sea and the void. I think the astral sea and void are are separate than this this new layer that you're able to go to um people who were lost out in the void would turn into like lost wizards and then i think the new sovereign type is supposed to be like what's past the void dude this is like it, what where you go to after you um after you go into absolute nothingness because the void is just like where you get cast out where you get exiled to if like you're super evil or, or something like that or if you're an explorer i think was the other way was your lost wizards were created we have um, ceaseless cacophony. I got to zoom in a little bit here. Enemies without the straight have a 15% chance to fumble. I don't think that causes damage like it did with misfortune, but fumbling's massive. If you're able to combine this with something else that affects things that are adjacent to the enemy, like um, a thing that reduces morale or hideous stench, that seems like a very good way of just. Um, weakening your opponent by simply placing units around them. And if you've got swarm mechanics, which seem to be a big part of the umbral units, I think, and maybe even the sovereigns themselves, then um, you should be able to place a lot of units around your enemies just to make them weaker. Uh, they also have Empowered by Magic. This is the, oh, I always forget how to say this. I think it's Sirens. It's kind of like the Sirens that call you into the ocean. Um, they they start off with this as a default. Once per turn, when taking non-physical damage, you gain strengthened for three whole turns. Pretty good. That means that your units will deal a lot more damage when they take magic damage, which should allow you to deal with magic uh, casters a little bit quickly. They can deal, typically, magic casters deal more damage to you, so being able to take them out quicker is generally a little bit better. While we didn't get to see Reavers in actions, they did mention pretty early on that Mage Locks now have a single action attack that's very inaccurate unless you use an ability that is, I think it's kind of like full action leave with an action point so that they, um, act like they had st stood still when you use that ability before shooting but they can still move to the edge of their movement and shoot with with low accuracy if that's something you want to do melee is also inflicting mark now i think you, your melee attacks inflict mark so it's easier to get that kind of interaction going off and i believe the cannons should be not on a cooldown so you can actually attack every turn it's not like they get to do something one turn and then are completely useless the next turn because that's pretty bad in age of wonders generally the fights are over pretty quickly so you want your cannons to be attacking every turn if you're if you're bringing a cannon the fact that they only have a, a single attack that um is a problem if somebody's in i think uh, zone of control is also a big reason why a lot of people weren't using the cannon i hope it's enough that people like it now I think they mentioned that dark regeneration is a bit different now. The when you heal, how you heal is supposed to be a little bit more intuitive. But I don't think that's actually going to make it a big difference in the long run. Right. This is this is um, the potential thing that Avoxel started to tease out earlier, um, like a week or so ago. And there's basically three subcultures for mystics kind of like the primals have a bunch of different spirit animals that you can pick between. If we zoom in here, you can see that astral only gives you one or excuse mystic only gives you one astral affinity now and then you can get a, another astral affinity through attunement or if you wanted to you could go for summoning for another um, astral attunement or you could do a mix of shadow and astral which is interesting because a lot of the things in this in this dlc seem to be a mix between the shadow tomes and the astral tomes i think shadow might be closer to the void and um the astral affinity might be closer to the astral sea and then umbral is kind of like some combination of the two or something outside of the two that's connected to it. i'm not quite sure i'm not quite sure i understand that whole dynamic and interaction um but yeah basically attunement is going to i think work the way mystics used to work you can get star blades you can collect astral echoes and then use echo casting to cast 
spells beyond your normal limits. So that, I'm not sure if that means it's like over channel or if it means that you can go past your normal casting points and just continue to cast. One word that I think a Vox will use a couple times was quicker. So I, I would imagine it's kind of like an over channel, which could be very good. If you combine that with a Wizard King, I'm not sure if you can over channel and echo cast in the same turn because that's that sounds like so, so much, way too much casting. Um, but then again, you could just run out of all your casting points if you use that at the wrong time. Uh, Star Blades is different now. I think that, yes, so it will give you plus one damage based off of the affinity of the spell. So it's not just a mixture of lightning, uh, what was the other one? Frost, I think it was lightning, frost, and fire usually. Now you could just get all fire if you just use Chaos Affinity spells for the Star Blades. That's, that's pretty interesting. It gets you, it kind of gets you to be able to lean more into a certain damage channel, a certain strategy, but it means that you won't be able to counter as many different strategies as easily because you don't have access to quite as many damage channels. I think having access to lots of things was just very good for when it came to rounding damage. Um, after that, what we have Astral Echoes allow attunement to, yeah, they, they basically get to pick up more echoes. And, um, oh, I guess they get to pick up echoes because I believe the potential one doesn't get echoes and summoning does get echoes. Yeah, so it could be either used for echo casting by attunement or echo infusion by the school of summoning, which I think is basically leveling up your your summoned units. We got to see that quite a bit in this stream, and I think the cost of that depends on how much XP they need to get to their next rank or, or level. Yeah, Potential wants you to have multiple spells you use, not a single one you overuse. That makes sense. There, there must have been something in there, right? Because they are overcharged for the first time they are cast in combat. They use their spells to exploit arcane inspiration. Not sure what that means. They inflict distance. Distance? I. I can't remember if they actually had that in the game beforehand, um, but I don't think they hovered over it. No, they do. They, here we go. We get to see it. All right. So um, overcharging a uh, thing means that damage things do 25 more, more damage. Healing does 25% more healing. Buff spells give you more bolstered resistance. Debuff does some sundering resistance. A common enchantment allows another spell to be cast that turn. Woo, that sounds pretty good. That sounds really good. <laughs> Combat summon spells gained plus two strength, and it seems okay. It seems not the worst. But yeah, that means that you want to just um, use something that's really powerful and then move on to a different spell. If you just keep casting the same damage spell or same summon spell, you won't get the benefits from this. Arcane Inspiration says um, when you complete combat, which spell is used at least once. And then there are some spells that use those inspiration points. Oh, so yeah, yeah, we haven't gotten to see that yet. That seems pretty strong. It seems like a pretty interesting mechanic that would probably need to be pretty strong to be worthwhile. Or then again, Mystics are always casting spells in combat, so maybe not. I'm not too sure. Uh, when an enemy overcharged spell is cast, this unit suffers four lightning damage per stack and loses all stacks. This culture's units inflict distance with their attacks. Oh, so if you attack and then cast a spell, they're going to take a little bit of, of that? <laughs> okay, but you if you want to stack a lot of them on an enemy um, to get more damage before casting your spell, that's probably how dissonance would work. Okay, cool. That sounds pretty useful. Um, this is from the Summing Tomb, so I do think this is stuff we did get to see a little bit in the actual stream. When you cast a friendly spell, you get strengthened and are healed for 10 HP. That's just the magic origin units. That's not all units. Okay, that's an important consideration. So it's a good way to just keep those magic or origin units topped up on their HP, as well as get some other value out of your spell. Uh, when you collect the echoes, you can use that to rank them up. And yeah, I think that can even lead to evolving your elementals if that's something you're, you're interested in. They gain an astral connection, which is... Uh, the magic origin units give plus five morale for each unit with this property. So I guess that means your non-magic origin units boost your magic or origin units. That would be what makes the most sense to me. Each culture, each subculture has a different SPI. I think this is something they showed off later in the stream. They said that the manolith is something that's unique to the summoner subculture and that the Others won't just get all mana. I think they will probably have some mixture of mana and research or mana and something else. 
the next thing I got screenshots of are these two new Shadow Society traits. There is Keepers of Knowledge, and then there is the Umbral Disciples. I think they mentioned how there weren't a lot of great options in the Shadow Society traits that people were picking. And um, another thing that I really like about the Keepers of Knowledge is it is a good alignment option for the Shadow Affinity, so you can kind of be a more diplomatic version of of the traditional evil or, or shadow faction i like mixing those two things i think being nice to the umbral dwellings um with shadow affinity makes a lot of sense for me thematically so i'm glad to see we've got something like this this says that unlocking your research will give you extra um allegiance with three cities and you get some alignment there may be something else in here that's covered but it seems like that's basically what you get for for this one um all for these unlock a new research skill gets you allegiance with all three cities to whom you have assigned a whispering zone so you need to have whispering zones in the cities that's an interesting thing that i actually didn't see until just now the umbral disciples are going to be uh, able to have an altar of marching gloom and you gain tyrant's retinue as well as you start with the umbral flesh which is something that I think I got a good screenshot of later on. I forgot to move it to this part, so I just remember I'm on 10 of 45, and we'll go towards, I think the bottom has, um, this is it right here, Umbral Frush. So basically, you can get extra morale and hit point regeneration when you're in Gloom territory, which I think usually reduces people's HP per, per turn they're standing in it using an umbral malady or, or something along those lines. So this should allow you to heal pretty effectively while around the, the gloom, which I believe can come through the umbral gates into the regular map, but it may not. I'm, I haven't played with it yet, so I don't know any of those details. Cities of the race will gain plus two dollars for income for each province with the gloom train. So I think that could be um, after it's spread onto the regular map. I know you can get these sanctuary outposts. They mentioned them. Um, but that's different than cities. So maybe that means you can get knowledge from those outposts like this, but I don't think so. Uh, you ignore the stability penalties from Gloom. I assume they're, they're quite bad. Um, here units gain Gloom Shepherd. Ooh, yeah, what's that? I like Shepherds um, in well, the Shepherd skill in, in the base game, as well as the Shepherd unit in Age of Wonders Plan and Fall. Shepherds are pretty cool. They just generally help uh, uh, other units quite well they either heal or evolve them or something along those lines next we have the tome of tentacles which we actually got to see in action quite a bit because it's a tier one tome they're able to unlock it very quickly and get a lot of these things going very quickly so the conjure tentacle here is a summon a mobile fighter unit with hyper awareness lasts for three turns it is uh relatively weak it doesn't have a lot of defense or resistance only has 50 hp and does 10 damage but that isn't the point of it is that it locks people down and i think i cut off the casting point cost here for some reason if i extend you do i get it no i don't um unfortunately no that is just going to be something that we'll just have to assume is relatively cheap and um yeah, I don't even think it says the cost for uh, the Constrictor here. Or actually, is that a unit you build? I think that might be a unit that you build. The Constrictor sounds very good. It sounds super useful. The fact that it can lock units down in place, making them immobile, and so that they take 10 damage at the end of their turn is pretty big. I mean, they're still going to be able to attack, unlike the Constrictors in Age of Wonders, Planetfall, where they took away the unit's actions. Um, so melee guys can deal with Constrictors that are right next to them, but range units they might struggle a lot support units they might struggle a lot with a constrictor that that gets them constricted of course it's only a 60 percent chance to happen so it's not guaranteed um that your just regular old melee attack is going to constrict the enemy they do have a pool ability which i don't believe they hovered over at any point but i believe that could bring units towards them making it easier to constrict them i'd be very interested to see if there's a constriction chance on that pool attack um I wouldn't be too surprised, but at the same time, it might just be a displacement thing, and then you constrict on the next turn, or you use a different constrictor to to do that constricting. Um, yeah, this is recruitable in the town hall, so you do have to build them. And one interesting thing they note about the tier twos is you can no longer just get them uh, as early. You need to get to town hall two, which is 
different than what it used to be. I think that used to be how you unlocked maybe like tier three units or, or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, now we can move on to, okay, yeah, here's the pool. <laughs> Wait, it just says becomes constricted. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> I forgot that I got an image here of the pool attack. So yeah, it just becomes constricted next to you. Amazing. Oh wait, no, 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 90% chance to pool them. So they may not even move. Okay, well, it's it's more likely than a 60% chance. Um, it's range three, that makes sense to me. I think this unit is gonna be quite powerful, quite good. That's a lot of HP. And um, I don't know if once they constrict, if they go into like a really strong defense mode, but I could totally see that. I think that's how it worked with the Planet Fall unit. All right, Eldritch Sovereigns. This is a new ruler type. We have the ability to use thralls, a new resource to cast powerful rituals. I think there's one that you could use to get a, a, a wisp. Um, which is okay, I guess. You can also use straws to make cities like you more. If you if you meet a free city that doesn't like you, you can make you can use I think like two or three thralls to get that. You can also get thralls by simply sacrificing pops. So I think I might play around with an eldritch sovereign that simply just founds a second city as soon as possible and literally every turn sacrifice a pop, sacrifice a pop, sacrifice a pop. That's three three enthralls which probably works out pretty good if you lean into that strategy enough but who knows maybe it's not worth it um i think you'd actually probably have to wait two turns for a pop to grow in your city but that might be all you can really afford in terms of casting points too uh, you start with clairvoyance ritual and an enthrall population ritual which is the one that i was just talking about the one that takes a pop and turns it into three um thrall units is pretty neat elder sovereigns have a five mana uh, unit upkeep and cannot equip leg or mount items. Yeah, I think that's mostly an animation limitation. They wanted them floating without uh, legs and without um, like mounts underneath them. So uh, I'm sure it took a while for them to balance the game for it to make sense for this unit to not have access to those things um, as well. Like not just from a thematic point of view, but for uh, making it so they can actually compete with the dragons, the wizard kings, and the champions. And I have to imagine that it's they they kind of took the point of view that it's kind of like a dragon because dragons I think have a higher upkeep cost, but it's gold. Um, but they also have less things that you can equip. They can't equip things to their chest or their head, unlike the elder sovereigns. Elder Sovereigns also will have access to powerful hero and signature skills, unlike the dragons. I think these are 100% unique. I think you get some specific unique choices at level 4, specific unique, unique choices at 8, again at 12, and again at 16. So um, pretty interesting things, because the dragons only got that at level 4 and level 12. The weapon choices are between a Relic of the Mind, a Relic of Flesh, a Relic of Havoc, which all look so cool. The Relic of the Mind is like a, a brain in the front, but my favorite has to be the, the, the D20. I think the Chaos, Cosmos, Cosmos is kind of like Chaos, right? Um, that one looks like a D20. I think Flesh is like some cell, and I'm not sure what Havoc is off the top of my mind. This one makes it so you do physical damage, bypass defenses, and you get Delirium. Delirium is really good, like really, really good. Uh, let's see, what else did I say here? Insane is slightly better. Now they prefer to attack allies over enemies if they can reach them. So yeah, Insanity is um, quite nice. I think Infectious Insanity is going to be even more useful now because you can actually get your units closer to the enemy without taking risk of them getting hit as well. Um, because they should just simply choose to attack their allies if they can. Delirium is not only going to inflict insanity, it's going to sunder defense and sunder resistance by five whole stacks for three whole turns. That's massive. That unit is dead. <laughs> if the enemy doesn't choose to kill that unit, um, you're going to be able to kill it after one turn of insanity. I think, yeah, one turn of insanity is not very long, so you kind of get to take it over, attack something that's next to it, and then the next turn the enemy is going to be back in control of that unit. But this, they're still weakened. This is cooldown 4, so you're not going to get to use it very often, but still, very neat, very cool. Um, Relic of the Mind is like this one. This one was mine, so it's just showing off how it bypasses 
defense and resistances with 14 damage. It's not a lot of damage, uh, but it's range 8 is very likely to hit. It's not guaranteed, it's not always hit, uh, but that bypassing is, is quite neat. This one deals blight damage, inflicts decaying and poisoned. Instead of just bypassing this one, uh, inflicts some, some status effects. And you get the Eldritch Ritual, which is not bad at all. This makes it so that you're... Your hero, I think, gets 10 extra HP. They get the ability to just say, I would like some some knowledge here, which might be how I use my thrall. So I might not get knowledge the normal way. I may just like sacrifice pops, get knowledge, sacrifice pops, get knowledge. Because I don't know, that sounds like it could be pretty good, right? Um, you can also use a thing to get extra draft on a city. And I'm not sure what the costs are on these. I don't think we actually got to see them in the stream. The Re Relic of Havoc is a fire damage one. This one can inflict a random negative status effect. So in a lot of ways, this is kind of like chaos as well, right? Or it's it's random, kind of like wild magic. Um, but I think there's something else later on that we're going to get to pretty soon that's even more like wild magic. It's a I think you're level four. One of the things you can choose when you get to level four. This relic says Relic of Havoc is going to deal fire damage, yeah, and then you can phase, which I think is like most phases, I think it's range 3 or 4 free action, so very good for getting into position for full action attacks like mind controls that the enemy doesn't consider that you actually have the range to get into, that's that's a side note, you know, <laughs> we don't need to worry about the AI in this video. Um, relic of the Cosmos is something does fire frost and lightning so it's split it does a lot of different damage channels and you can summon the wisp at the cost of thralls this is what they chose for the the stream i remember them getting an astral wisp through thralls at the very beginning yeah i think you start with two so it if you want to you can spend it on that astral wisp just to have an extra unit on the field to gaining experience which is probably generally pretty good i think this is a very solid tier one unit i'm seeing two defense two resistance 45 hp at no experience once it gets to, I think, rank elite or legend, it's going to get a lot more uh, defense resistance and damage on top of the fact that it's going to get HP from all those ranks in between. Very, very nice uh, spell to get at the very beginning of the game. I can't remember what other sources there are of Astral Wisps, but I don't think there are a whole lot. Um, now we just, I took a couple images of what these weapons look like. This is the, Hav not Havoc, this is the biological one, the flesh one, and this is the D20 that I told you about. It's got these runes, the numbers. Somebody translate this, right? <laughs> I think it's just numbers. Um, you can use the item forge to switch between the different relics. If you don't think that one of them is going to work against this particular enemy, you can build a different one, which is, it's just neat. It's kind of like the dragon claws that they, they, um, added to the item forge recently. So if you want a different thing, you can do that. I think pretty early on in the stream, they did mention how there are these new beetle mounts. You get access to the regular ones that aren't gonna change the way your units interact, and you can get access to an exotic one. I think it's called like death beetle. So although we haven't seen how it works, I would imagine that when it dies, it probably blows up and, or does something like that. I think a lot of the beetles in previous Age of Wonders games, they, they kind of have like a caustic effect. I think there was a Kirko summon that it would just explode when it died. Um, so I, I would expect that's that's how that works, and I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty excited to see um, if I'm right or not. The next thing we have here is the Eldritch Mind Control, which all sovereigns are going to get this ability. This is something that, regardless of what relic or or background you take, you will be able to do. And this is a mind control that lasts for one turn. If unsuccessful, they lose their actions for one turn. So it's almost like they're mind control. They're they're not going to get to do anything, which I think could be a pretty effective way of shutting down certain guys um, as they get close to your your army right before they're about to do something really important. Of course, you're going to need to use a full action with range force. So your hero's got to be pretty close to them at the beginning of your turn, or maybe they phase before they do this. I think this, combined with the delirium, is a lot of mind control effects. I'm really interested to see how people deal with the fact that there's going to be a lot of opponents that can mind control their own units. I think I'm going to be picking resilience or things that can clear um, insanity. This is mind controlled, which I think is slightly different than insanity. I, I'm not too sure. There's there's been some discussion on the difference between those types of tags and in, in the Discord, and I I hope that it just kind of all consolidates into one rule and make it a lot easier for my brain. Um, yeah, if you want to, you can use your thralls on clearing out a fight and getting the army leader. So uh, that can be quite good for 
certain tricky fights that might have mind controls that you don't want to risk losing a unit on or losing the entire army on because that can happen if you're you're facing against lightbringers or nymphs they might just act, they might just get your units for a few turns your units might instead of attacking the enemy just attack your mind controlled units and then you lose the the fight that otherwise wouldn't have been too tricky for you in uh, in manual combat i think i might use this against certain stacks i might say oh that tier three is actually that fits my build really importantly i need to get my thralls ready so that instead of getting research i get this particular unit to to help my build or maybe this unit is a unit i really need to fight an opponent that's nearby so i'm going to thrall it and, and um, bring it into the fight I actually i i think thralls are going to be something that people don't want to invest in because you have to sacrifice something to get it but it's going to be so good that people end up um, shifting towards it eventually i don't know on paper it sounds really neat of course you want to get experience on your units but getting the right units is right before the right fight that's that's super big um because i think countering is really how you you get the biggest advantages in this game we have something called desperate anguish this is a thing you can pick once you get to um level two or three this is just kind of like the delirium or eldritch ritual choices that you get at the very beginning um if you want to you can go back and pick something you get from a different relic or you could try something like this which is a target enemy a single unit unit loses 30 xp not xp morale and is stunned for one turn if unsuccessful they just lose 15 morale i don't know if that's very good i mean it sounds neat if you get the stun to work but if you can't get that to be a higher than 90 percent chance i don't know if i take that um doesn't seem super impactful and i guess range six is okay you can do it from a decent range but i don't know that seems still a little bit risky we have eldritch influence which seems so good i think this is going to be something i pick pretty early on too because it is a lot of um economy getting that much imperium per turn is massive getting four extra imperium a turn means you're going to be able to found cities a lot quicker i think if you take sovereigns with adept settlers you're gonna have a lot of cities very quickly and um, that's probably going to be how i get my uh, thralls too i'll probably do it something like this uh, getting the extra casting points is not bad at all it's very useful actually i, I think that's massive as long as you got the mana to support it casting points are great um phantasmal ritual is something that you can use on an army you you get a little effect on your hero you get magic attacks get 10 percent more damage you can also then cast a spell which costs i think thralls it's saying i think it says costs two thralls 80 casting points and one turn to do this thing that will reduce the enemy's hp by 20 percent which is better than doing damage in most situations if you're able to do 20 damage to a bunch of tier one units that might be better than taking away 20 percent of their hp but if you're dealing with something that's got 150 hp then you're going to be taking away a lot more with this spell than with something that just deals in raw damage the fact that it causes a enemy to lose three status resistance is pretty massive too i think if you combine that with blizzard or flash freeze you're just going to be mind controlling everything like how can they how can they stop you at that point right um i guess kill your units before you mind control that might be one way of dealing with it or dispelling certain effects um quickening ritual is something that will make it so that your friendly army can get very fast movement not only on the world map but in combat it lets you move really far on the on the world map but then also when you get into combat you're going to be able to move around very quickly that seems risky because sometimes units run too far forward and get themselves killed before all their their guys have kind of collected together um the hero is going to have extra evasion against physical and magic attacks i think i'm seeing on the right hand side that it's got the large target tag uh so that doesn't even counteract the lar large target tag <laughs> that's that's not bad but i think that this unit if people want to hit it it, it won't be too hard to um, hit i get i guess if you put like wind barrier and this on it then you get past the large target tag but you're, you're you don't benefit f from it as much as a unit that doesn't have the large target tag before they start applying benefits like this um completing research gave echoes i think this might be a mystic thing it might not be it might be more of a summoner thing um, but yeah they got 20 for completing a tier one research i think you get 40 for completing tier two research and 60 for tier three research that's what i remember them mentioning and yeah that's pretty good because then you can use that to level up your your uh your summon units if you're playing the summoner the tendril labyrinth is a thing from the um 
Tome of Tentacles, which will make it so your cities get more gold, more stability, and when they're besieged, they summon in tentacles, which is which isn't gonna probably win you most fights on their own. You of course summons plus the tentacles and one unit might be enough to to keep you in the fight. I think tentacles are non-vital, so you, you might need more than one unit. Your enemy kills off that one unit, the fight's over. Um, the one like real unit, the one non-tentacle unit is is really important when you're defending if you're just gonna leave one unit in dispel on a, a city. Seems to me that yeah, it's saying that it it doesn't tell us how much it would cost in terms of mana and casting points, but I think that yeah, you don't want this in all of your cities, probably. But um I could see it being quite nice on, on a lot of cities that are just like not even in immediate danger, but could be in the near future because 10 gold and 10 stability, that's nice. That's quite good. It might have a mana upkeep that makes it less um, beneficial, but I don't know at this point. Conjure Astral Ward. So here we have the ability to basically ward our guys, make it so that they don't take damage directly, uh, which is quite good if um, you've got units that are really close to the enemy. Um, but I think that the amount of HP and defenses that are on this make it so that that unit dies pretty quickly, uh, even while warding, because the enemy will take quite a bit of damage usually. If it's if it's something you're warding is probably in danger, so it's going to take quite a bit of damage. I don't know if that's worth 25 casting points, 30 mana. It doesn't seem like it is to me, but maybe I'm missing something about the Astral Ward itself. Maybe it can't be attacked if it's somehow immune to damage. Um, from direct damage, then maybe it's worth it. I don't know. This is only range four. It's immobile. I don't know why you'd ever cast that. <laughs> uh, Conjure Tentacle. Now that that's that's something you, I would probably cast. Oh, I think earlier we didn't have the the casting cost thirty mana, twenty five casting points. I don't know if that's as good as a uh, Primal Summon. It sounds about as expensive, uh, but it's good that it can't be flanked and. Um, I think it, 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 I think it might have an attack that locks people in place, kind of like the Constrictor. Immobilizing units is pretty useful. The Living Vines definitely work like that. I could see them working the same way. They kind of look similar, don't they? Uh, the next thing we have here is Constricting Focus. Ah, oh, there we go. Constricting Focus, right? There we go. This is going to be how you constrict a lot of people. 30% chance is not a lot, but the fact that all of your magic attacks are going to have that interaction and then things that are non-repeating will be even more likely to constrict i think 60 percent to constrict on maybe like is this this is going to work on aoe this isn't this so if like, <laughs> you got awakeners you can you can throw down 60 percent constriction chance on a group a giant group of melee guys that you want to keep out of range of your awakeners right um yeah I gotta play around with this tome in skirmish mode. That's gonna be really interesting, being able to use magic like that. So I did mention earlier that you need town hall two now to hire tier two units. I think that was highlighted in fact the same screenshot. I may have just brought it earlier, and I may have mentioned earlier that you can use your thralls to make cities like you more. They don't become a vassal immediately. I think if you're gonna be using thralls on it this is something that i want to cast i want to use more thralls on and i want to not just simply sway because i don't think sway is particularly powerful it doesn't it doesn't come online fast enough especially when you consider an enemy can just walk into your city and take it just knock it down and take it off of you like being evil is just so much it pays off so much faster so um i think if you're going to be using your very important thrall resource on this you need to get a bigger benefit out of it Arcanus main damage depends on the subculture. Yeah, so because they're summer, this is all lightning. And if they had been potential, then it'd be half lightning, half frost, because they have like a slight frost affinity associated with the potential subculture. Um, I did mention earlier that you get thralls from sacrificing pop. I may have said two, but it's actually three. That's pretty good. A lot of the things cost two thralls to to use, and um, yeah, thirty mana, thirty casting points a pop. If if you got the pops to spare, I think this this is going to be something I'm I'm going to end up using quite a bit. Um, I I don't think I'd use it on my capital. Probably only on the second or, or third city or a conquered city. Now we're getting into the like stuff towards the end of the stream where we started to get to see the umbral realm and the those enemies that are in there so a mature splitter splitterling splitterling is slightly better than the one that you can get from the um 
thing is like a flesh weaver signature skill, which is coming up soon. We're, we'll cover those soon. And those guys just simply blow up. They just just die and, and after one attack. This this unit has a melee attack that allows them to stay on the board a little bit longer, but they're not a particularly strong one. A lot of these units um, specialize in spawning in not the mature splitterlings, but I think like the lower tier ones and other tier like one or lower tier units to swarm the enemy. I know there's one that does um abduct enemies they consume them and then it starts like creating new ones kind of like the chrysalis and age of wonders Clanfall. i love that game i love how many like parallels there are between this dlc and that uh that that older game retaliating growth is not bad it gives a ability to get unlimited retaliations on a unit so if you've got a very tanky unit that you can place in in between um you're a bunch of enemies, not just one or two, but maybe three or four. That's that's a great opportunity to put this spell on them and get a lot of value. You might constrict them and keep them from being able to run away. Um, as long as the enemy can't kill off that unit, that's very good. Seems like it doesn't even cost that much. 10 mana and 15 casting points. I hope the AI doesn't <laughs> do it at a silly time. But at the same time, giving yourself the ability to not get flanked in defensive mastery that sounds pretty good in auto combat i think that would help keep your units alive um more often the umbral malady immunity is something that's just on these these umbral units or if you take the, the flesh weave or flesh something rather um transformation that i think you can get from the dwellings then you, you can get access to this interaction as well all right, next we have a change to Cole of the Week. Yeah, this says heals the attacker for 10 H temporary points once per turn, which is kind of like the lifesteal, but it's just, I think it's a little bit clear to see that your guys are actually healed before you pass the turn over, which is probably, it was probably quite confusing to a lot of people. I don't know if anything else in here changed, so we can just move on to this, which is what it costs to rank up from, I think like, level one to level two which costs six experience so it costs 12 of these points to do that and i think in order to go from 12 to 24 experience it needed 24 of these points if i zoom in here it says 24 astral echoes to rank up the uh the summon unit i, I couldn't get a great quality image of it so we can just move on from here but basically yeah you can use xb to rank up your wisps for some reason the wisp Wait a minute, it's listed as needing 8 experience here. Yeah, that doesn't make sense with the number 12, does it? Well, maybe he already had a little bit of experience from a fight that I, I missed. And um, what's interesting is this guy only needs 6 experience to get to... Yeah, okay, so 6 plus the 2 here should take you to 8. Yeah, this is not entirely clear to me. I think I need to do a video on XB once... Um, the new content comes out just so I understand it and so I can help other people understand it. But one of the big things here is basically soldier, veteran, elite, champion, and legend it works the same for tier ones and tier twos and tier threes and tier fours. Or I think in uh, principle, that's how this is supposed to work. It's supposed to think cost you the same amount of experience and you're supposed to get the same reward regardless of what tier the unit is to try and make it so that the tier one and tier unit units stay viable for longer and can compete with the um the tome units from that they give you like tier threes and tier fours and tier fives but i saw some people saying this just basically invalidates tier fives like why would you ever take a tier five if you can get a tier one unit that effectively works like a tier three unit but it has less upkeep i don't know it may be an overcorrection but i'm very excited to see how this actually works in our multiplayers i think it's going to be fine um people might just be overreacting because this change and change is scary right uh next we have a gargoyle which is needing 18 experience to go from veteran to elite and um yeah it's just it's one of those things where i think i could look up how it currently works and show you that that makes sense for a tier 2 unit uh but maybe the tier ones are on like the tier 2 unit xp track now i'm, I'm not particularly clear on it right so i did talk about this one earlier it costs two thralls 80 casting points pretty cool unit to get access to it no longer evolves so there is that consideration i think in general it, it does a lot of damage and the fact that when people attack it, it stuns means that the the ai won't really understand how good of a unit it is um and yeah it'll just kind of make some weird decisions about how it would engage the wisp 
uh, yeah, we talked about the ward earlier. Unleash the Hounds has been moved to Toma the Horde, and I think they replaced the Unleash the Hounds with something called Monstrous Rebirth. This makes it so that you can turn a tier one, two, or three into a war breed that just dies at the end of combat. So it doesn't stay a war breed and you don't keep the unit at the end of combat, but it's a good way to kind of spike up your your potential to do damage and in a way that your opponent might not be expecting. I think a lot of people wouldn't actually expect you to sacrifice one of your other units to get a tier four on the field for 45 mana and 30 casting points. But I think in the right position, that could be very valuable. I, I forget exactly what the war breeds do, but I think they have a full action attack that can sweep a lot of units for a lot of damage. So. I don't know. It seems nice. It also heals the unit, so you can like take a unit that's like almost dead, or maybe, maybe a summon actually, maybe something that's gonna disappear anyways, and just turn it into a warbreed. Actually, wait a minute. If it's non magic origin, non construct, you won't be able to use it on a lot of the summons that you can get. But you could maybe mind control an enemy, sacrifice them, turn them into a friendly warbreed that's just under your control. Yeah, that's what you do. <laughs> That's really good. Um, Rock Blast is now not just damage, it cancels defense mode and retaliations, which seems quite nice. I think that's actually still quite a bit of damage. It may have been 30 damage beforehand. So it's it's not that it doesn't do damage at all now, it just allows you to engage more easily. Um, it's kind of like a charge unit. Obsidian weapons now apply bleeding and I think I saw some people saying that that's still quite not enough. I think it would be neat if they had more damage on top of that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be taking obsidian weapons ever. I never used to put all my heroes. Um, and that's mostly because I, I felt like there was more valuable things in here, like summoning a spirit or or stone skin or, or um, earth can, I think were all pretty good. Actually, you know, I, I don't think I'd take stone skin. I think I just mix those two up in my head a lot. Um, all right. Next, we have the signature skills you can get on your Sovereign. So they did mention that there's basically three archetypes that you get to choose when you get to level four. And then at another point, you can choose between two options for each of those archetypes. So I think that's going to be like two for this Madcaster, two for the um, uh, Flesh Weaver, and then for the uh, two for the Mindbreaker, I think it is. Yeah, Madcaster, Mindbreaker, and Fleshweaver, I think, are the choices. The first one, the Madcaster, gives you this ability, Chaos Pulse, which is like rolling a dice. At the <laughs> this is uh, enemies in a one hex radius have one of these effects applied to them. Some of them are good, like healing 10 HP is something you don't really want to do to an enemy, but giving a group of units insanity for three turns that's something you want to do to an enemy and it's incredibly powerful turning them into tier one units that's also really funny it makes them really easy to kill off too um and just engage with but yeah it's it, it's very chaotic this is kind of like the wild magic thing that i i mentioned earlier it's interesting that that's not tied to the the weapon that looks like a dice but rather it's tied to these signature skills so Regardless of what relic you take, you can decide to be a mad caster and go for this Chaos Pulse. The other thing that comes with Chaos Pulse is Expert Channeling, which is going to make it so that your the mana you use to cast spells on enemy armies is, is less, is 30% less. The, the damage spells and the debuff spells that you're using in combat, they're going to cost 30% less mana. It still costs the same amount of casting points, but it's going to save you mana, which is generally pretty good. Um, Mind Breaker is going to make it so that you have a 70% chance to inflict madness on a unit, which is like insanity, but better. It takes five physical damage each turn, and I think they just stay that way until the end of the combat. Sure, it's only 70% chance, but if you can increase those chances to 100%, there's no reason why you wouldn't want to take this. I think taking a dice roll that when it fails makes something insane isn't terrible but when you compare insane for one turn and um to mad for the rest of combat that's it's just way better to get things that are mad for the rest of combat um still doesn't mean i wouldn't take it at 80 percent every once in a while and there's still 80 percent chance that you get something very good but if it's like 50 percent, i'm not i'm not i'm saving that uh, ability for a better opportunity i think the fact that on top of this skill you're abilities are going to be able to ignore up to three status resistance means it's going to be a lot easier to get madness to trigger and all the other status effects that um, are going to 
you know be associated with your sovereign will, will be easier to trigger because this guy just ignores status resistance uh, there's another one that mind controls i can't remember yeah eldritch mind control that's going to be more likely to trigger as well um after that oh yeah there's delirium as well right yeah tg this delirium that you got three mind controls on your hero by like i don't know turn 10 or something <laughs> so much mind control possession is actually for your friendly units it makes them stronger you can use them on your summons to make them just like really good before they blow up or um, disappear after three turns this is cooldown three and powers are two turns so i think it's actually pretty perfect for putting on a summon um flesh weave is is the thing that i mentioned earlier where it spawns into fleshlings okay yeah fleshlings are different than splitterlings i don't know that the, the all the units quite yeah i don't think we saw the splitterlings mature splitterlings in combat yet but i think these fleshlings are weaker than other fleshlings that are in the game um because they're things you get at the beginning of combat uh they they give you get two of them it's it's kind of like getting a wisp at the beginning of combat or uh, an golem assistant generally pretty good but there there could be better options out there i think i think i much prefer the ability to ignore sass resistance and mind control versus empowering my own units and then just uh, getting a little bit more damage but you know maybe i'm missing something here and now we're getting to other things um like the wizard's tower is going to be more expensive i think it costs 50 more gold and 50 more mana than it used to to make it so that you, you kind of have to rely on your lower tier units a little bit longer we have this button over here, which takes us to the new Umbral layer, I think is, is what they're calling it. Um, unlike Primal Summon, you can only research, or this is like the Primal Summon, you can only get this ability to spawn in Astral Echoes after you've finished your first tome. So um, you can't just, I think, get a bunch of experience on your on your summons if that's the, the type of mystic you went for. You can't just get a bunch of like casting if you're the... Um, Oh boy, I can't remember what the other one was. It's probably like a channeler or something, right? Moving on, we have yeah, a picture of the Umbral Gate and the Umbral Malady affecting a unit as it passes into there. We get to see the Will Thief. I think we actually saw this one in action, didn't we? This guy has a Umbral Lash that links to a target and they become infected with Umbral Drain. They also have Corp curse eater which is going to heal them from status effects um, they get that from being an umbral demon all of the umbral units are going to have the ability to just heal themselves from status effects uh, this says yeah lose one random negative status effect and heal 10 hp that's that's pretty good um what does umbral drain drain do i think that appears in one of these umbral taints uh spittering death call no i don't think i got a uh, picture of it well i'm sure it's not too complicated probably like uh, puts debuffs or um, causes you to take down hp while they get hp it would make a lot of sense um after that we have some screenshots of a unit that has umbral flesh this guy's just kind of in, under their control in the underground it's kind of like been enthralled by them and will support them it's, it's neat that it's not just umbral units it reminds me again of planet fall with the void bringers you can't make cities but you can build on this layer yeah you can build outposts i don't think i got any screenshots of that because they didn't do that in the stream but we did get to see that in the dev diary um, which i covered uh, on, on friday no thursday i can't remember anymore the umbral juggernaut is pretty cool it does this emerald taint ability it will make it so that units that pass through this hazard lose um, morale and they get decaying for three turns which is means they can't heal not only are they going to take damage over time decaying means they can't heal until you counter that with maybe regeneration or remove it another way it's a pretty powerful status effect and one that you you can't get around with the um umbral malady immunity of course these units if you can mind control them they'll come with it or you can get it through the uh yeah like we said the umbral flesh transformation um what else do they have here there's a split splitterling death call yeah i think when this unit dies he brings in the splitterlings and then there's something about umbral wake i think yeah that's this that we're seeing right or no underneath that this is umbral dis dissolution that's what leads the umbral taint i'm not sure what umbral wake is um, does it say underneath here, Umbral Taint? 
it's under control. No, I don't see it here. Um, but yeah, this is the unit that spawns in units. It's pretty funny. When they abduct, they get um, the ability to consume things, I think. Yeah, this is, says, if successful, they gain Sated Rift and they consume a unit. If resisted, they just lose five morale. And when this unit is killed, the unit that was last consumed will come back to life. Okay, that's pretty good, actually. So he summons a Sterling and Jason until the end of the turn, as long as he is sated, and it doesn't disappear after it summons in once. So yeah, you can't use Abduct. So it kind of goes from an, a unit that you want to avoid uh, to a unit you, you, you need to get to. Because <laughs> once you get close to him, he'll Abduct and start spawning in things. Interesting. Yeah, I think I heard the Abduct itself doesn't have a huge range on it. Oh, there's Umbral Drain. Okay, here we go. So the unit sustains 10 frost da damage and loses a positive status effect. The linked unit gains healing and steals a positive status effect stack. Oh, it steals the positive? Oh, that's interesting. Umbral Drain is going to be quite good. Um, Umbral Lash. Yeah, that, that applies the Umbral Drain that we're seeing here. I should have organized a little, these a little bit. As you can see, there's a lot that we've covered here. Um, this guy blows up and dies when he does that, but he inflicts a lot of bleeding and status immunity, so it's generally, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty worthwhile as long as you can get it on more than one unit. I mean, maybe every once in a while you have to put it on one unit because that unit has to die. Um, but I think you want to put this on a, on a group of guys if you can. The Quicksilver Basin was a new site that you can visit to give yourself a fast movement. That sounds super useful in the um, underground because your guys are going to need to move very quickly to get to healing and get out of the Umbral Malady as, as quickly as possible. The site can only be visited every five turns. I think that is regardless of player. <laughs> oh no. Oh no, we're going back to this fast clicking game. Oh no. <laughs> uh, I guess it's part of playing on Simultaneous. Um, I'd like to see this be unique for each faction so I don't have to like f worry about somebody else clicking on it before I do, just with their scout to deny my six units actual movement that they need. It's kind of not my favorite interaction, but hey, it is, this is going to be a part of the game sometimes. Uh, yeah, there's a snow that gives you a lot of gold. There's one that gives you a lot of mana, and I think that when you clear them, you probably get a bunch of gold or a bunch of mana. All right. So Cody was saying that they compared T2s and T4s um, as well as T1s and T3s. If you get a T1 Anvil Guard to max rank, they're going to have 120 HP, 4 defense, 2 resistance, 10 damage. A Bastion's going to have 100 HP, 4 defense, 2 resistance, 12 damage. And if you add some things like Tome of the Horde, all of a sudden the Anvil Guard's just better. I think if you Mighty Meek, that Anvil Guard is going to be really, really strong. Um, but yeah, the fact that it has more hp and less damage makes sense to me like you've, you've put a lot of time into leveling up that unit it should have some benefits from that and i know that um the 10 percent damage could add up to be a lot but yeah if you're not modding it i think that it makes sense that they're they're comparable i don't know it might be too much it might be that they need to reduce the benefits for some of the uh lower tier units again but i don't know i'm I'm happy to see how this plays yeah i i agree hooray the air of t1 units is coming <laughs> morgi is saying that mythical units are pretty much dead no ranks no enchantments fighting into 200 hp t3s is an important consideration yeah i think this bastion right here that that cody was uh, theory crafting with this is a completely unleveled bastion if you can get that a bunch more hp and then defense and resistance and damage there's there's no competing a T3 with a Mythic unit. They're just going to be <laughs> so much better. And then Mythics, of course, cost Imperium. Uh, T4s cost Imperium. I guess one thing you could do is get rid of that Imperium cost. I actually would really love that if they did that. Um, but I do think Zombies are bringing up an important point that you need 80 experience points to get to Legendary rank. Yeah, and that in the short term, a Tier 1 is more profitable. In the long term, a T3 is more profitable. So there's going to be... A consideration there that you you have to keep in mind you it won't always be one or the other um lesser storm spirits <laughs> apparently will have more hp than a full storm spirit before it evolves if it has plus 50 hp and then its defenses are slightly weaker or rather it has one less point of resistance and cannot phase so actually you know what i, I think that makes sense the hp bit is a bit odd um pyromancers 
having all of this damage does seem also pretty cool. And then if you compare that to a transmitter, it's just it's gonna be a lot better. Um, captured units apparently are now going to grant experience. That's something that I know a lot of people weren't very happy with when it came to the Reaver faction. So um, very happy to see that. And I think that's pretty much everything I have for you today. There were a few things in the dev diary that I didn't cover in too much detail, like how you can get some things from the, the dwelling here that may not be accessible in any of the other tomes. I think this is the fourth tome of Oxel mentioned. There's kind of like another tome in the tome library that has a bunch of their stuff in it. And that must be things like the Umbral Fresh, the uh, Summon Umbral Juggernaut, the Altar of Marching Gloom. There's what, one, two, three, four, five, six things here. That seems about right for a tome. So it's been a few days since I recorded everything before this, except for that little bit about blueprints at the very beginning of the video. And I just wanted to say a few more things about this image before moving on to some other things that I've seen posted over the weekend, which um, is that you can get a lot of production for, I think, just 30 gold. I don't know if this is 30 gold for each turn, so that'd be like 300 gold for 600 production, or if it's literally just 30 gold for 60 production over 10 turns. If that's the case, that's very efficient. That's better than the vassal income that you get here. This I don't think is significantly different than a high tier vassal. I, I had some high tier vassals in a local multiplayer, in a recent multiplayer, and I think I was getting similar amounts of gold and mana, maybe not as much research, but that's, that's a discussion for another time. Um, the fact that these are all just like 50 Imperium or 100 Imperium reminds me so much of the way Influence worked with Dwellings in Age of Wonders Planetfall, and I'm really happy to see a return of that. It, it does seem like something that they may try and do in the future with other um, with other Dwellings. What else do we have here? Yeah, you can get I, a unit from this. I don't think that that's probably worth 150 Imperium because I'm pretty sure the Umbral Juggernaut was a tier 3. I'm not so sure about spending 250 on umbral flesh but going into that space could be worth it yeah they're, they're, some of these are pretty cheap some of them are very expensive i didn't see that initially i'm not sure paying 53 mana every turn to get 60 food in the city would ever be worth it but once again yeah if it's just a one-time cost that seems very nice um the kirko are back as the shad Shadirko faction. I think there's the Shadir were like the evil guys, and it looks like they took part of their name to make um, something similar to Kirko. This might be the origins of the Kirko, which would make me very happy. I did a, a little video on that a long time ago. If you wanted to watch that, I, I, we spent like an hour and a half just pu pulling together all the evidence, all the breadcrumbs, saying that these are more closely linked than they look similar. It, it could be that it was just a little Easter egg reference um, in, in art design, but it doesn't seem like that's actually the case. I should have made this one definitely a lot bigger. Uh, we have another screenshot from, I think, the Steam page here that shows off actually what Gloom Strider is going to do. You can see this guy has tentacles for legs. He, he couldn't take the, the mount option. I think that's kind of uh, obvious, but he did get 40 movement points and an ability called Manifest Tentacle. Those seem to be the only new things here. Oh, right. No, there's this little tag here. It's something hanging off on the right. And I think this tag is different than what the Umbral Flesh tag gives you. The Umbral Flesh tag will make it so that your units can heal more in the um, umbral space as well as a few other things but i think the demon one yeah this is the umbral one it makes it so your cities get knowledge and they don't get stability problems when they are um dealing with the gloom terrain they get something called gloom herald but the the demon one that was something that was associated more with the these units here and it would give them i think like a little bit more defense as well as the curse eating ability yeah they get defense they get a little bit of weakness to fire a little bit of weakness to spirit damage and they are immune to the umbral maladies so that's interesting that you can get access to that through a tome because um yeah the umbral fresh like we saw that's something you can get through a dwelling and that means you have a couple different ways of interacting with this this new gloom train and the new umbral units uh the blueprints that we talked about a little bit earlier the eldritch sovereigns are ethereal have pass through and flight innately was something that somebody just mentioned quickly to me and i want to make sure i highlighted that here because yeah ethereal is a pretty unique tag being able to pass through things and flight is, is pretty nice um apparently the stormbringers got a nerf i think a voxel said that this is probably not going to come up in stream so he just wanted to show off quickly how the throw storm trident isn't as good as it used to be i actually 
didn't look up what it used to be, but I just wanted to show off that this is a piece of information that the devs started putting out there, as well as how there's going to be some changes to some of the buildings and how they support your units. If you want to get the armory, or not the armory, the thing that comes before the armory, you'll just get plus, two, plus one rank on every tier one unit. That's pretty amazing. That's going to really elevate the tier one units even more than the changes. It even, I think when you combine that with the changes to the way you get health and, and defense and damage and resistance, um, it's going to make tier ones a lot more viable. Then there's also the fact that you can get some boost to your tier ones and tier twos on the, I think this would be the armory, right? And then after that, you get the Smith Guild, which is, I think, listed right here, which will give you plus two starter ranks to every tier two and every tier one. It's interesting that that doesn't give bonuses to the tier three units. I feel like this is going to be really strong on certain units, and I definitely saw... Um, Cody saying similar things about like Phantasm Warriors without all these bonuses they were already concerned about some some of those better tier one units like the Phantasm Warriors or the Anvil Guards um, but yeah that's everything I have for you today I'll see you around have a good one